I want to wish you a happy Easter as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, things are very different from normal. Typically, I'd be surrounded by Easter lilies, which are beautiful as they release their pollen into the air, meaning I can barely breathe. Ah, the smell of fresh, stale building air. You know, it, it's actually great. Well, after the service, we normally gather together. We eat and we share, we have food and we fellowship. Um, today, this will be ending by me waving goodbye to Frankie six feet away from him. And if Frankie had decided to even bring some homemade food to share with me, I would have had questions for him. Number one, did you wash your hands? Number two, did you wash them for at least 20 seconds? Number three, were you wearing a mask? And last but not least, number four, are you so annoyed by all my questions that you poisoned this food? Well, according to experts, the human body can go about 30 days without food. That's a long time. My guess is I could make it longer than that. How long can you go without sleep? That's the question. Now, some of you may wonder, is this during a sermon you're talking about? Because I can't go very long before I nod off. The good news is, unlike church, when a couple of you look like this, you can simply hit the pause button and go grab that nap and then come back and finish the sermon, please. Well, in general, we're, we need water the most, more than anything else. See, they say we can go without um, sleep for about 10 days. Water, three days, is what some person will typically be able to live without drinking water. If your body's shutting down, maybe you're near death, you're just lying in a bed, it can be up to a week. If you're out somewhere dry, arid, maybe you're walking to find water, typically two days is all that you will live. Our bodies require a lot of fluid. Matter of fact, they say we need about four times as much fluid as we do food. Our bodies are typically made up of about 60% water, which means I'm dragging around over 100 pounds of water. We're supposed to drink a glass of water a day. I tend to do that, if not more, and that's when it's good we have times like this, when we are stuck indoors because the bathroom is always close. Well, the geographic area where the Bible was written was an arid, dry, dry place, barren. Back then, water was literally a matter of life and death. At times, if you were going somewhere and you couldn't find any, you wouldn't make it. And so the Bible uses the metaphor of thirst in a number of places. Proverbs 25, 25 says, Like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. Have you ever been really, really thirsty? If so, water hits the spot. It's exactly what our body wants. Mmm. So good. And it says Dallas Cowboys. How could that not be amazing? It's recyclable, people. This is great. Well, the fact is, we all need water. And there's an Easter story that begins by talking about water. And so I want us to look at that today. The first thing we're going to look at is this. Hygienic hands. In the past month, we've learned how to wash our hands properly. Back in the old days, when you actually could go to a restaurant and go into stores without trying to escape as quickly as you can with the items you grabbed, people would use the restroom. And there were times I'd be washing my hands. I'll be honest, I was not a 20-second person. I was more like 13, 14, 15 seconds. Always soap, but I would see guys just walking out without washing their hands and go, ugh. And then there would be the guys who'd walk up, turn the water on, stick their hand under it for literally like two seconds, no soap, turn it off, and be like, you know, I'm good. Now we know, 20 seconds, which, as I mentioned before, feels incredibly long when you're doing it. You know, squirt, it takes forever, a little bit of soap, and just the washing, it takes a long time to do it right. Well, there's someone in the Bible who tried to wash their hands clean, and they failed. So... We're going to talk about Pontius Pilate to begin with. You may remember the story. It's Good Friday. If you watch my Good Friday devotional, you know kind of the background of this. But Pilate is the Roman governor, and he is over the area of Jerusalem. And the religious leaders have brought Jesus to him because Jesus has blasphemed. He has claimed that he is God, and they want him dead. 
Pilate has looked into the issue and can see no reason Jesus should be killed. He's done nothing wrong. But still the crowds that have been enraged by these religious leaders are now shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And so we read in Matthew chapter 27, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead of up, but it said an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. But no matter how hard Pilate would later try to wash his hands, no matter how much at that day as he tried to show them, I've washed my hands clean, they weren't clean because the guilt was on his heart. He's doing what many of us do. He's guilty and he wants to pretend he's innocent. He had enough information to make the right choice about Christ, but he refused to make the decision that would lead to life. You know, a lot of people don't hate Jesus, but many do what Pilate did. Pilate even seemed to almost admire Jesus, but still he washed his hands clean of him, and many people do that of our Savior. Numerous articles have pointed out that the number of those people who believe in nothing has increased drastically over the past decade. They're called the nuns. They have no belief. And the number of those who consider themselves agnostic, meaning, I don't know, maybe there's a God, maybe not, or atheist, there's definitely not a God, that has just risen exponentially. So what about you? Have you washed your hands of Christ? Have you moved on? You may have experienced some incredible pain and loss in your life, and you're mad at God today. Maybe Christians or the church hurt you, and I'm sorry if that's the case. But maybe that caused you to reject the Savior who loves you so much. Well, maybe you're wandering spiritually, but there's a thirst in you. Hopefully that's why you're listening today. I truly believe you won't be satisfied until you accept the love of the Savior. You can use water to try to wash away your sins, like Pilate did, but it won't work. Second thing I want to talk about is a cracked container. After washing our hands of Jesus, some have tried to satisfy this thirst, this longing in our souls for more, through possessions, through the pursuit of pleasure, through another person. And certainly through this time of COVID now, we're seeing those things come crashing to the ground. Our possessions don't mean as much unless it's our TV and Netflix account. Uh, the people that we love, many of them we're not even able to be near. And Pursuing pleasure, well, that's not easy in this day and age. Well, there's a verse in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah that's quite descriptive. God is speaking to his people when he says this in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. A cistern was an artificial reservoir that was dug in the earth or hewn out of rock. It was made to collect water to store it. Again, this was a dry land. There were very few springs. And so cisterns were made so that during the rainy season, water could be collected so that later there would be water available to keep the people alive. I remember visiting the fortress, the mountain fortress of Masada in Israel, up on this steep area, surrounded just by cliffs. There were a group of Jewish rebels that held out for months against the powerful Roman army. This was only possible because they had cisterns that they had filled with water. Without these man-made containers, they would have died in days of dehydration. Well, in this passage in Jeremiah, God says his people have messed up in two ways. First of all, by washing their hands of him, the source of fresh, living, good water. But more than that, not only have they abandoned God and the good water he offers, but they've dug their own cisterns, their own place to hold water. And these cisterns are going to be filled with stagnant water, yet worse than that, they are cracked cisterns that don't hold the water. It all leaks away. A broken cistern was worthless in ancient Israel. Cracked rock or crumbling masonry could hold only a small amount of dirty water or none at all. You know what? We could all have what's called broken cistern syndrome. Our lives are just full of holes. And we try to patch them up just as they would have in ancient times. They would try to fill cracks in the rock. But eventually the cracks would resurface. And it's true in our lives. 
Many of you right now with the coronavirus, you're feeling cracked, scared, you're bored, you feel hopeless. The things you filled your life up with, they don't last, and you're realizing that now. Well, my wife is a counselor. We lived in Maryland. Deb worked at a hospital on the drug and alcohol unit. And I remember her coming home one day and telling me that she had a client who was addicted to vanilla extract. That's right, vanilla. Ends up that there's a small amount of alcohol in it, and this woman would drink that. Now, I was amazed, first of all, because if you've ever bought one of those little bottles of vanilla extract at the grocery store, not the imitation stuff, it's cheap. The real stuff is very expensive. She would have been better off drinking scotch if she wanted to save money. In addition to that, have you ever tasted vanilla extract? I have, and it's terrible. Remember as a kid, my mom would make Toll House chocolate chip cookies, and they were amazing. And I loved, as a kid, to try to sneak some of the dough. The sugar and the brown sugar and the butter all mixed together. Some chocolate chips. It was so good. But I remember once deciding to see, I want to know what the vanilla actually tastes like. And so after she had poured in just a tiny teaspoon of vanilla extract, I just put my finger into that teaspoon and tasted it, and it was awful. The thought that this woman would drink that every day was amazing to me. But here's the thing, she was searching for something to fill the void in her life, searching to, for something to fill in the cracks. Well, no substance will satisfy your thirst, whether it's that the buzz has worn off and you need another hit or six pack, or that you need to go do whatever it is you do to relieve stress or to feel whole again. It, it doesn't last. Only a relationship with the resurrected Lord, who on that first Easter Sunday was risen, that's the only real hope we have of being fulfilled and being filled. The Bible says we all have a sin problem. We're broken by our own selfishness, our own sinfulness, and we try to satisfy that brokenness by pouring stuff into our lives, only to see it leak into the ground. Because we've forsaken God, our sins have caused a divide between us and between Him. Isaiah 59 says it this way, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear you. You know, our sins have separated us from God. They've left a chasm between a perfect and holy God and broken and sinful people like us. Well, our lives, again, they may look good from the outside, but we know what we're really like on the inside. We know the sin that's there, the brokenness that's there. Tom Petty, a few years before he died, wrote a song and the chorus said this, I have a few fault lines running under my life. Tom was a broken sister. The sad thing is that uh, drugs have been part of his life off and on through, sounds like, most of his life. And at the end, he died from taking too many prescription painkillers. He just finished a long touring series. He was in the late 60s, early 70s, and was in pain and took too much of these things that he had turned to over the years to fill in whether it was the physical pain or the emotional pain. Some of you have been trying to fill in your fault lines, but it's not possible. So washing your hands of your sin trying to fill your life up with things that's not going to work. So what will? Well, we can have a sanitizing shower from Jesus Christ that can make us clean and pure. My job now is does not typically make me dirty. At the end of the day, I've been sitting in an office typically. I've been on the phone. I've been writing. I've met with people. Well, not now, of course. But back when I was in seminary, I worked construction during the summers. And I was the low man on the totem pole because I knew the least of anyone. If there was something skilled that needed to be done, they asked another guy. If there was brunt manual la labor, that was going to be me. Ditch needs to be dug? Mark. Something dirty needs clean? That's going to be Mark. Is there uh, something needs to be swept up? Again, that's going to be Mark. So at the end of the day, when I got home and took that shower and was clean, it felt amazing. Friends, we're all pretty dirty in a moral sense. 
after committing sexual sin and then murder to hide that sin. King David said this in Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Now, it's been a while since we've seen snow, thankfully. But snow is so perfect and pure and white. And that's what we want to be again, is to be made right. All of us have a desire to be clean from our moral dirt. The Bible is clear, though, that that can only happen when we allow Jesus Christ, the one who died on that cross, and when it's then resurrected on Sunday, the one who gave his life for us, he's the only way we can be made pure and be cleansed. Because God gives us, through forgiveness, the new life of Christ. I have a mound of moral dirt, and so do you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So how much longer are you going to go through life feeling dirty? You need a shower to wash off your shame. Jesus is offering a cloudburst of forgiveness, but you must receive the Savior so your sins can be washed away and you can be made as white as snow. Your heart pure in a way it's never experienced. Well, the fourth thing I want to talk about is this, the living liquid that can make you clean. One day Jesus sat by a well and he met a woman who was wounded and wandering. Her life was a sinful mess. Matter of fact, it was around noon when she was at the well. The women would have come earlier in the day. She's there alone because good women don't want to be around a woman with a lifestyle and a reputation like hers. So Jesus has a comment conversation with her about water. And as he reveals himself, she finally begins to understand herself. She thought she'd hidden all of her junk away behind a curtain. But Jesus knew it all, and he loved her anyway. Her sin was hanging in the air, dirty and foul, but Jesus offered cleansing in John chapter 14, in John chapter 4, when he said this, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Whoever drinks the water I give them, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. When she speaks of a well, she's thinking of a cistern containing still and stagnant water. What Jesus is talking about here is water that's gushing, overflowing into a fountain of life. This woman had two problems. First of all, she's drinking from this well where the water is not going to taste great. It will have been sitting there for a while. But more than that, once she does drink from it and carry it back to where she lives, she's just going to finish it and be thirsty again and need more. None of her relationships could replenish the needs she had in her life. The bitter disappointments, the poor decisions, the shattered dreams, they were all there. The gossip, the endless shame took a toll and shriveled her soul from the inside. Not only in her body was she dehydrated, her soul was parched. Her thirst was unquenchable. That is until Jesus offers her something that will last forever. Later, Jesus was at a religious reenactment of the miracle where water gushes out of a rock. You may remember from the Old Testament when Moses and the people of Israel in the desert, and they are literally dying of thirst. And God provides it through this rock. So later, the people would reenact this. They would remember once a year by living out in tents, and they would pour out water for seven days. On the seventh day of this festival, as the water was being poured out, Jesus said in a loud voice, in John chapter 7, we read, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow with, from within them. By this he met the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Now the invitation of Jesus still stands today. Are your insides starting to shrivel up? Are you parched for purpose? Jesus would say, then drink from me. He's living liquid. His spirit satisfies us as it flushes out our fears. For so many of you, you are living right now in a time of terror. You worry about your life and about the life of your family and friends. 
COVID is just always on your mind. Jesus came to take away our fear, that we could give it to him, knowing that he is God and that he's in charge, knowing that our eternity is safe if we know the Savior. The Spirit also came to dislodge our disappointments, to purify our putrid souls. Jesus makes this invitation, we're told here in John 7, to anyone who is thirsty. That would include you. The question is, do you want what he has to offer? You need to welcome it into the, into the inner workings of your life. Let Jesus Christ be the water of your soul. You know, when Jesus was raised from the dead on that first Easter Sunday, the women arrived and they saw the tomb was empty. And then the angel tells them, he's risen, just as he said. And then later they saw him and the disciples saw him later that day. And then hundreds of his followers would see him, proof that the resurrection was real. Now after that he ascended into heaven. In his place he sent us his Holy Spirit who comes and lives in the heart of those who believe in Christ. He gives us the strength to face things like the coronavirus. He gives us peace in spite of what we're facing right now. And he comes to live in us and give us hope and a future. Now Jesus uses a verb here in this John 7 passage that suggests repeated swallows. Literally it means let them come to me and drink and keep drinking. When we first come to Jesus, we take a big gulp of what he has to offer. But then we need each day to continually just ask him, Lord, again, refill me. Lord, again, do your work in me. Forgive me, make me new. And he will do that. You know, the gift of grace is given to us without cost to us. It cost Christ everything. He died a sinless man, God's son, died on the cross that we could have life, died that we could have a way to God. In the next to last chapter of the Bible, we read these words from Jesus in, John, in Revelation chapter 21 when he says this, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, literally the A, the Z, that would be the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. He says, I'm the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I'll give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. That's a beautiful promise for me, for you. Jesus offers eternal water for all who are thirsty and will come to him. He says that we can become children of God. How amazing is that? To know that we have a Heavenly Father who loves us and wants to be there for us. But you've probably heard the phrase, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, and that is certainly true. I know this because of our dog, Bear. When he was a little puppy, we went away for a week, and we came back, and for some reason he'd become frightened of water. Yes, he was literally hydrophobic. We tried his water bowl. He would not drink from it. So we changed bowls. We went to a metal bowl. Nope. We tried one of the bowls we use for breakfast. No. Then I started getting more creative. I tried a mug. He didn't like that. And then it occurred to me what he seemed to be afraid of was the water itself. I talked to a veterinarian in our church, Tom Potty, and said, you know, what do I do? And Tom said, well, there's not a lot you can do. Sometimes dogs become startled by water. He said, normally they'll outgrow it. And uh, so we found a mug, a very small, narrow mug, tall but narrow. And when he put his snout down in, he could not see the water moving. So about three times a day, twice some days, maybe three at the most, he would drink water. And it was always a long process. We would have to get down on the floor we would get his water, we would have to hold it in our hands, and we'd say, Bear, come here. And the bears would be like, that's a good boy, Bear, Bear, come on, that's a good boy. And he'd slowly make his way over cautiously, fearfully to the water bowl. And then most of the time he'd back away from it, and he'd be like, come on, Bear, come on. And, and sometimes he would literally go hide underneath the table. But a few times a day he'd get his, you know, he would break through his fear, and he would go over to that water, and he would drink and drink and drink and drink. And we'd refill, he'd keep drinking, and then he'd be done, and then for like the next eight hours, he would be so afraid that, again, you could tell he was thirsty. He would come when we called him, he would go near the water, but he would not drink it. 
Once I had the early on, I thought, you know what, I'm going to make this dumb dog drink. I know he's dehydrated. This isn't healthy for him. And so I got the water and I literally kind of pulled him over to it and I put his face by it and said, come on, bear, drink your water. And he would not do it. And as a matter of fact, he was worse about being near water after that. So I just had to say to the family, like, listen, we just need to wait till he comes to us because it doesn't work when we try to force it on him. Here's the thing. Our God does not grab us by the head and force us into his living water. He calls to us. He asks us to come. He lovingly invites us to drink the water. But he won't force us to do it. He's waiting for your thirst to become so strong that you can't resist any longer. That you realize that you need the Savior in your life. He's inviting you today. Well, will you receive the water? Water only works if you'll drink it. Thankfully, our dog eventually, after about two years, got past his issues. But our Savior won't save you from your sins if you won't acknowledge that you need him. If you won't admit that you're flawed, that you've sinned, that you need forgiveness. Jesus waits with his arms outstretched, but we have to be willing to receive him into our lives. So if you're thirsty for the forgiveness that came through Jesus Christ's death on the cross, and if you want the life that he offers through his resurrection, as he himself rose from the dead, that he offers you new and eternal life, if you're ready to try to stop washing your hands of your own sins and let Jesus make you clean, then I would invite you to make this Easter that day that you received God's great gift. In Revelation chapter 22, the very last passage in the Bible, Jesus says this, Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. It's free, but you have to take it. If you want your thirst satisfied, you need to come to the living liquid to Jesus Christ who poured out his blood that you could have life, who offers his forgiveness to all who would come to him humbly and admit that they need it. If that's a gift you'd like to receive this morning, I'd invite you to pray with me. There's nothing magical about this prayer. God just wants to hear from you that you're willing to admit that you've done wrong and that you want his Savior in your life, that you want God to become Lord and to take over from this mess that you've made. If that's something you want to do, pray with me now. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm thirsty today. I've tried to wash my hands of my flaws and of the sins that I've done, the way I've hurt people and the ways that I have broken your laws. And Lord, I can't cleanse myself, so finally I admit that I want your cleansing. Jesus, I thank you that you poured your blood out, that I would not have to pay the penalty for my sin. And I thank you so much for being the living water, the one who rose from the dead and who now offers for me to drink of that water. And I do want, Jesus, for you to come and live in me. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would come and bring your power that I may now live for you. That as your water fills me, that it may flow out of me and I may share it with others around. Jesus, I thank you so much for this love that you have. And I thank you most of all that my eternity is secure because of you. That because of this gift, I can know that I will be with you forever. Jesus, I thank you so much. And Father, I thank you on this Easter. For those of us who know you, that we can bask in the goodness of your love. I thank you that today, even far apart from one another, we still have reason to celebrate our Savior. And Lord, I pray finally for that person who's watched and they're not convinced. Lord, reveal to them the truth that you love them. Father, we thank you for this love. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.